Hello, folks. This is Dr. Turpo. I am here today uh, interviewing someone on the Dr. Turpo Show, where we actually talk about uh, people's stories. I think that one of the most inspiring things that I can think of is when I talk to people in my practice, individuals, and just in life period, and they tell me their story, it's very inspiring. And I think it can be inspiring for us to learn and listen to other people's stories. So particularly people who have uh, succeeded in certain areas of life, it can often be um, a very good thing for us to listen to and help us to move forward in our lives. So uh, today I have a guest, um, my mother, uh, <laughs> and her name is Brenda Clarkson Turpo. And uh, through the years, I've listened to her stories uh, about what, what it was like for her growing up and even into today. And so today I wanted to interview her. And the title of the show is Who is Brenda Clarkson Turpo? And so we're going to get into the interview. But before we do, I just want to uh, encourage everyone as you listen to this and watch this uh, video to please uh, like the button, uh, click the like button on the YouTube video stream there, and also uh, share this video. That's even more important. If you could share uh, this video uh, with others, that may inspire them as in their journey in life as well. So, and uh, as always, subscribe to this YouTube channel. So without further ado, we will uh, jump into uh, uh, interviewing uh, Brenda Clarkson Turpo. So, hi mom, how are you? Hi, I'm fine. How are you today? I'm doing well, doing well. Great. Um, we just want to jump right into the story here, your story. So tell us a little bit about uh, where you grew up, what it was like for you growing up as a child. Okay. I grew up on a farm, a large farm in uh, Richland County, South Carolina. And I lived in an extended family. And the home place was the place that wa wa all the activity went on. It was a lot of business. I grew up with a lot of entrepreneurs. Everybody in the family was an entrepreneur. My grandmother, who was born in 1910, she ran several of the businesses. And uh, my father and my two uncles ran this farm. And um, I was the oldest of the grandchildren living there. And so I didn't realize how much I was absorbing from um, learning about entrepreneurship. But I learned a lot because you'll see later on when I talk about my life that I learned a lot. And we were running in, on this extended farm, three gin houses, a sawmill, um, a logging business, and um, raising uh, cattle, uh, farming, farming was one of the big ones. And uh, I was trying to find, but I was watching all the trucks come and go, the workers uh, getting ready, gassing up trucks, getting tractors ready, and watching my grandma do the, um, the gin houses, she was a businesswoman. She was a real businesswoman. So I got, uh, without knowing as a child, and I lived there for my first 11 years of my life. So I got a lot of information about being an entrepreneur. Okay, all okay. right, very good. Now, mm -hmm. I know you've grown up in the South and uh, as a black, black American family in the South, what was it like? Did you have any run-ins that your family had problems with racism or anything during that? Gym oh, career? God, <laughs> did we ever. <laughs> uh, you might notice from my physical appearance mm -hmm. that I'm fairly light-skinned. Mm -hmm. And uh, my family basically were blonde and blue-eyed. My mother was brown. And we are in the lower part of South Carolina in Richland County. There was always problems with the business area of it. Um, my father and my uncle would go and get business login contracts and stuff. And um, they may be told in the spur of the moment that they weren't gonna get paid. Uh, or if they got a job, they were paid half what other people, what other, um, entrepreneurs got when it was realized that they were black. So yeah, it was hard. It was hard growing up in school. I was told many times, you don't belong here. I went to Booker T. Washington High School in Columbia, South Carolina, and I was told many times, why don't you go where you belong? You don't belong here. 
And, um, but along with that, I learned to live with a life like that. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I call myself, um, walk in the medium side of it because after leaving high school, I had a great high school though. The best part of it was I was a majorette and my cousin was in charge of it. And therefore I could go to all the gangs with her. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I had a great time. But as far as racism, my grand, my father was threatened because he was suing the state of South Carolina doing the separate but equal standards. Um, Our bathroom, our schools were wooden outdoor baths, rooms, and we had to, the young men in the school would have to go out and and gather wood in the mornings before we started school and come into the school building and build a fire for the teacher and for the students. So um, that's early on. And my father was tenacious about uh, getting a better building for us to go to school in. And so he sued uh, sue the state of South Carolina or the county in which we lived. And, um, and that was a, a, a sort of a frightening period for us because uh, the, the um, KKK sent word by a white minister there that uh, to my grandfather, for my father, and um, it, and the word was, tell your son it's no need of him losing his life on this because integration is going to come and it's going to be separate but equal. And those were frightening times because my mother was afraid. And when a mother is afraid, she passes it on to her children. Mm-hmm. And we grew up in a home with guns loaded in the corner and we knew never to touch those guns. Um, my father was not um, a nonviolent person. His message back to the Klan was, come on, somebody's going with me. Mm-hmm. And I can shoot, my son can shoot, my wife can shoot. Uh, you know, that was what we experienced. And um, another big incident, and I'll share this with people, especially living in Georgia, my father and his brother were hired to clear the airfield for Columbus, Georgia. And so they got this contract and went to Columbus. They took about eight men, all their tractors and um, tents and stuff, and they went down to Columbus, Georgia, and they cleared an airfield. Uh, for about eight weeks, they cleared this airfield. And when it was getting near time, no, not when it was getting near time, in the middle of the process, um, the, whoever we hired them came over and told them one day, you need to get your boys out of here and get on back over to South Carolina because you're not getting paid. You, you're not you're not doing what we want you to do. So you, oh, you fired. And um, they couldn't understand it. And and then um, someone told them that when they found out that they were black, they decided, and this is in, uh, let me give you a year for this. This is in the late 50s that this happened. So, and it was hard maneuvering from South Carolina over to Georgia, but they had to pull up everything they had, the tractors, their men and everything, and go back to South Carolina. So Mm -hmm. I just, that was an interesting story too. So it's been an interesting life growing up. It was not evil, easy. And I can tell you an incident of my sister. She was out with her boyfriend Mm -hmm. um, on a date and her boyfriend's father was a big construction worker in um, South Carolina. And, um, he was, I don't know what I call names, Mr. Langley, I'll call it. And he was doing a big project there. And so his son was showing my sister uh, his project. And the cops came along and they locked him up mm-hmm. and told her, you don't have any better um, white boys around here. What you doing out with this colored boy? Mm-hmm. 
So uh, they locked her up and locked the boy up. Light skin and, and white. They thought she was white. She was fair skin, very fair skin mm -hmm. and blonde. Mm -hmm. And but she was out on a date. Right. And they put her in jail with a woman who had just killed her husband. I mean, these are the kinds of things. And they called my dad and said, do you know your daughter's out with this color boy? And dad said, yeah, I know she's out with him. And he, and, and they said, um, well, uh, we locked her up for trespassing. And you better come down to the jail and get it. Dad said, you don't want me to come down to that jail and pick up my daughter. You better call Mr. Langley. Mm -hmm. And so he called Mr. Langley. And so Mr. Langley went down to the jailhouse in Columbia. Mm -hmm. And uh, after uh, coming up off of $1,500, mm -hmm. Mr. Langley was able to pick up his, my sister and her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. So those were the kinds of things we experienced. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I can tell you some more if you want to know. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep moving and we'll keep moving forward. I'm sure you, I know you have a lot more stories. Uh, so tell, tell us about the college, your college years. Okay. They were great years. I met your father in college. All right. <laughs> he was my first boyfriend. I was 17 and he was 18. All right. Uh, and we were playing around. He was interested in my roommate and I was interested in another guy. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and we were all a group of friends, so uh, it was all right. We were talking and he was supposed to be my running, run, running buddy for getting this other date together for me. Mm -hmm. and, and so by the time he finished that process, we were going together. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how I met your father. But mm -hmm. I met him at West Virginia State okay. uh, University. And then in my second year, third year, completion of my second year, um, Aaron pinned me, and you know what pinning means, this means like pre-engagement kind of things. Mm -hmm. And then I transferred to Mount Mercy College in Pittsburgh to get a specific degree. And um, they had it in Charleston, but I could not go. Okay. So um, I, as, as I recall, I hope I'm recalling this correctly, the state of South Carolina paid my tuition to go to Mount Mercy College in Pittsburgh. Okay. All right. All right. Why is that? Because it was segregated in, in South Charleston, South Carolina. All right. And then rather than have me go there, mm -hmm. they would send me up north. Right. Yeah. And they would pay the tuition. They didn't, they didn't want you there that bad. And that's right. They did not want me. This was uh, in the 60s, 61. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So tell, uh, tell us a little bit more about your life in the 60s and the 70s. And what was going on. Okay. I got married in the 60s and you were born in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And my life changed a lot then, having a child. And um, I pretty much could find any kind of job I wanted. So I worked at the Jewish hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio. Aaron and I went back to his hometown to live. And um, having, when you become a mother, there are all kinds of stressors. You know, I had to find a, a babysitter for you. They didn't have the daycares like they have now. And I was luckily blessed and got good caretakers. Mm -hmm. um, then we bought our first home there, and um, I was working in as assistant um, to a, about 40 people, um, and it was called a medical records administrator. I set up information systems and 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 things of that nature. And then uh, your father got an opportunity to move to Lima, Ohio, to do the Urban Coalition. And um, we stayed there and made friends. We integrated the neighborhood during that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, one little girl came and told you, I don't know if you remember, that um, we're going to kill your family, something mm -hmm. like that. I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't know what else she said, but you came home frightened. And I said, don't worry about it. We're going to take care of it. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Maynard Jackson came to town to speak for the, the Urban Coalition. 
and um, Julian came, but when Maynard came, he invited, it, it was a specific thing your father did, like pe getting people together and discussing things and building communities. And um, he persuaded Aaron to come to um, Atlanta. And I've always wanted, I call this going back home because it's down south. And um, Aaron was, didn't know anything about the south. And um, his father, Aaron's father said, oh no, I don't want you going down south. And anyway, <laughs> we moved down south <laughs> and we moved to Atlanta and uh, we've had some amazing experiences here in, in Atlanta. Okay. And um, that was when I first went into business for myself. Mm -hmm. And this is when Aaron was director of the CEDA program you'll hear about you can read about in Atlanta. But um, my first business was A&B Triple N Company. Uh, this is when I did consultant work and I went out to nursing homes, health centers. I worked for CDC. I worked for um, uh, Grady with a maternal and infant care project, Dr. Luella Klein. I did that three different times at Grady. And I moved, I went to Negro Old Folks Home in LaGrange, Georgia. How about that? Mm -hmm. Nice and one of those a beautiful nursing home that had about eight candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then I went to Snellville. I went all around. I did the state's mental health institutes and um, just organizing their information systems and establishing record systems for their patients. Okay. And um, so that was my first entrepreneurship job and it came to me naturally. I, I mean, it just came to me. I was amazed at myself. But in 82, I decided I wanted to do something different. I wanted to try retail to see what I could do with that. Okay. And I had big plans for this retail, but um, Starbucks stopped that. But I opened the first gourmet coffee shop in downtown Atlanta. It was called the Coffee Port, and it was in Peachtree Center. I knew I had to be in a group of international people, and I had to have foot traffic and all of those things. So your, your I, shop was one of the uh, pioneer coffee shops in Atlanta. This is before, absolutely. This is it before was. Starbucks even got to Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah, before it got to Atlanta, and it was one of the first in downtown Atlanta. I don't know if they had any in the surrounding areas, but I decided... Um, I, I wanted to franchise it, so I got a franchise lawyer, but I did some real research and went across the country looking at coffee shops, and I went to California, and you know, they're about five years ahead of us with this kind of thing, mm -hmm. gourmet stuff. And so when I got out at Calif got to California, Starbucks was on the move, mm -hmm. and it was millions of dollars behind Starbucks, mm -hmm. because I had acquired, um, a lease in Phipps Plaza and in underground Atlanta while I was at Peachtree Street. And um, we were building a home and um, it was too much that I could do at that time. And I saw that Starbucks was going to clean it up. Yeah. And they were marching across country and as they marched across country, they brought with them um, more money. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad I stopped that franchise yeah. process. Yeah, you saw the hand on the wall. Back, I missed two important things to tell mm -hmm. you about family life. Mm -hmm. um, well, we'll talk about family life a little, a little bit later. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but in the meantime, but, but doing this retail business, everything just came back to me like my grandma was whispering in my ear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I was, I was proud of her. Little yeah. short woman, four feet eleven, yeah. and she got handle that. That her kids used to tease her about. Mama has the first nickel she ever made when she, <laughs> sixty years afterwards. <laughs> we were taught to save too. <laughs> yeah. Well, good, good. Um, and so you were just going to mention a couple of things about family life during this period of the eighties. Yeah, in the 80s. Uh, well, not just during the 80s. I forgot to tell you my son, my baby son, he, 
Michelle Martinet Turpo, known as Marty, was born um, in Cincinnati, Ohio, <clears throat> prior to, uh, just, just prior to us moving to Lima, Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure I tell you, and he was a challenge, let me tell you. My, <laughs> Marty was a real challenge. You were quiet, but Marty kept me on the move. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he brought joy. But um, in the 80s, I, we adopted, the whole family, adopted uh, a girl, my daughter, your sister, mm -hmm. um, from Ethiopia. This was during a time they were having a severe famine and war in Ethiopia. And um, her sister came to me in the coffee shop and she said, Mrs. Turpo, you don't know me but I know of you and your husband. Would you consider helping my family and adopting my sister? Mm -hmm. And so we started from there, uh, working that out. And it must have taken us about a year because we did not go to Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. She was sent here and we, on I forgot the name of that form, but to be educated. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we brought her mother over here to meet us and to uh, sign all the legal papers for us to adopt her. And that was a real challenge. Mm -hmm. That was a real challenge. And um, because it was hard for her and it was hard for me because we were the two people in the center of, of that adoption. Yeah. But one thing I can say about my family, when, when we came to the table with the idea of my sons, Aaron Jr. and Michelle, um, and we said, we want to adopt a, a, a child. And so they said, um, you yeah, know, Rip said, Aaron Jr. said, um, if that's what you want to do, then you do it. We'll do what we have to do. Mm -hmm. And Marty said, now this is not going to mess with my inheritance, is it? <laughs> <laughs> question but he's been a real brother to her over times and, and and it was yeah it was hard for her she didn't speak very much english and and her language was amhari yeah. but we worked together she and i had the toughest time um my husband was the mediator through all the fights and everything and, but um it all worked out good in him. It all worked mm -hmm. out. I kept saying, God, you know, did I do the right thing? I did it right. And she was saying, I hate this lady. <laughs> but no, no. And um, it, it worked out. She's my daughter. And I mean, she's really my daughter. Mm -hmm. Okay, in all ways. That's Alan, Dr. Alan Turpo. Uh, Dr. Alan Turpo. And now she's a physician, so she's a success story. America. Yeah, she okay. is a real success story. And um, I'm proud of all of us doing that. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Don't you feel good about that? Oh, yeah, definitely. It was a good good decision on your part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, and so you sold your shop in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Right. Coming up to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Coming up to the Olympics because everybody wanted to have a business going. Yeah. And I saw where I needed to get out of there. I had it for 13 years. Yeah. And it was very successful. Okay. But I was tired too. So I, I, I came home, but that didn't stop working. I took on different things like presidents of different organizations. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so now uh, during this new millennium, you've gotten into your genealogy. So how was that process for you? Yeah. Well, before I got into my genealogy, I had four grandchildren. Oh, that's right. And oh, mm -hmm. they're the center of my life and the light. Mm -hmm. Oh, they can. And I'm known as Nani mm -hmm. to them. <laughs> and um, they have given me so much joy and they're good kids. Mm hmm. You know, so now back to your other question. Yeah, so you started okay. doing your genealogy research. Yeah, yeah. Um, when I went to college, and I, I didn't know what I wanted to do, mm -hmm. you know. I, I didn't know, so I just went on and picked something that I thought I could, you know, work with and help the family make some money. But um, I got into genealogy, and, um, and then I realized, you know, 
I probably would have been an anthropologist had I known about it, but I did not know about it when I was in Sky High School. But, and I ended up uh, researching my family back about 220 some years documented. And I wrote a book called Almost Forgotten, The Real America. So tell us a little bit more about that book. Huh? Tell us about your book. Almost well, um, I, it took me about six years to research the data because I had to go through archives, families, records, and uh, papers, and libraries. I traveled to Alabama. I did D.C. I was over in South Carolina all the time. Wherever I found a lead, I went. And the book has turned out well. I wish I could show you one here, but it doesn't work well to show you the title and every, but you have to, you have to pick up one from me. Um, they, I've got several reviews on it I'm from Dr. Young, from, um, uh, uh, from Dr. Lowry and, uh, Is Billy Andrew Aaron, Young and Joseph Lowry. And Andrew, yeah. Andrew Young and Billy Aaron, who, Billy Aaron. Mm -hmm. yeah who is my friend, mm -hmm. and uh, I've got several really great reviews. And I had fun doing it. That yeah. was that was important. I had fun. I cried sometimes. <laughs> I put my head down in the library, and I'd boo-hoo when I'd find a great-grandmother who had been murdered. And uh, so, okay. you know. Yeah. And, uh and so that's um, so. Is there? How can people get your book if they're interested in getting a copy? Um, well, you can order it uh, online at my husband's website, mm -hmm. www.aaron.group. What is it, Aaron? Aaron group. Um, dot us or yeah i forgot it dot com okay well, yeah. they, i'm sure if they can google uh, almost forgotten um, the real america the real america arts and turpo i know at one time it was on amazon is it still on amazon no it's not on there anymore that i it it came out in 12 2012 okay. uh-huh so um i just gotten lackadaisical now all right <laughs> okay but you can get a copy okay yes, yeah all right, and so the and the uh, last thing, just you started a foundation. Tell us about the foundation. Oh, I forgot about that. I've been busy since <laughs> I've been doing retired. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> no wonder I work every day. Um, yes, um, my parents have passed on, mm -hmm. but they were hard workers in our community. And our community, uh, like I said, was segregated. But my father was a stickler for getting an education. He didn't go to college. Mm -hmm. He wanted to make sure all of us went to college and become professional people because he said farming wasn't for us. We couldn't take it. That was hard work. That was hard work, but he did it. Yeah, you know? I remember when I was following behind him uh, one day on the farm and uh, following behind him as he was trying to fix the tractors and that type of thing. And he was cussing up a storm <laughs> he was. And, and he turned around to me. He stuck his finger in my face. He said, boy, you listen at me here. You listen what I say. Don't ever become a farmer. <laughs> yeah, <he> did. <laughs> I did yeah. not go down that route. So yeah, mother would often <laughs> look out of the window when he was working on a tractor or something, yeah. and and he would um something <laughs> would happen and something would drop down or hit him in the head and he cursed a few words. Then he he'd back away from the tractor and then he would um look up in the sky. And he asked God to forgive him. <laughs> oh, for all the cussing and all that? <laughs> yeah. Get I think God would have been okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> that, then he was okay with it. With it. Yeah. <laughs> so. so it's been interesting. And yeah, the foundation. Foundation, uh, uh, we started. I, I'm the president. And my sister's idea. Mm -hmm. I said, I live in Atlanta. That doesn't matter. You do it. And so it was in honor of my parents. And basically and the foundation does what? The foundations, um, the foundation raises money and gives scholarships to 
children or young men at the high school where Lower Richland High School where um, in my community now and um, and it's if uh, African American males get a first opportunity if they make a if they're qualified and you all you have to have is a 2.5 average okay and so thus far we formed with uh, central carolina community and foundation the big one in columbia and so far we have given away 18 scholarships very good uh-huh uh, we're proud of that and we're still working on it i'm, t I'm working toward it uh becoming um in perpetuity, okay. meaning that lasts forever. So that as long as forever is. Okay, so tell people again the name of the foundation if they're interested in more information on how they can contribute and help these uh, young black male students in Lower Richland County, South Carolina. Yes, it's Central Carolina Community Foundation in Columbia, South Carolina. And the fun is my parents' name, the Zach and Rachel Clarkson Scholarship Fund. Okay, all right. Everything is a 501c3, so it's tax deductible. Okay, all right, well, very good. Uh, we're gonna have to start wrapping uh, the interview up. I really enjoyed it, but um, any last little words of advice that you give to someone who wants to go out and have a successful family life, a successful entrepreneurship, or taking on a project like writing a book, or just all the different things that you've done, any particular advice you can give to um, posterity as far as how to live life in a fulfilling way. Okay. Um, and it's the decision you have to make within. I knew when I was a little girl that I wanted to be a wife, a mother, and mother. So I knew that part as uh, I wanted a family. I knew that. And so when I met your dad, I felt like I could make that commitment. And I felt like that he was making the commitment. And it's like you are saying um, to the all to God, to the Almighty Spirit, that I can do this. I want to do this, and you fight hard. It's not easy. It is not easy, and you you try to make sure that you're honest and you're trustworthy. Trust is very important, and you have to keep your integrity about you. Okay. Okay, right. is that good enough answer? Oh, excellent answer. Oh, another thing. Here, yes. I'm a stickler for organization. Okay. I'm a stickler for organization. If you outline and get yourself organized and you give the proper time to it, mm -hmm. you know, you can get there. Yeah. All right? I agree. Okay. <laughs> I agree. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Mom, for sharing. Uh, that was a real, real nice, inspiring interview. I enjoyed yeah. listening to some of those stories and um, I love you very much. I love you too and thank you. All righty, take mm -hmm. care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.